We're in a sermon series uh, called Let's Do This. It came from a, from a video teaching we were watching of Pastor Symbolism, where he kind of divided believers into those who are just kind of in autopilot and, and just attending church or not attending church and not tending, not tending to their walk with the Lord and their relationship with the Lord, contrasted with those who are saying, look, if we're going to do this, if we're going to have Jesus in our hearts and lives and the Holy Spirit in residence, then let's do this thing. That Ethiopian pastor that came was so singularly used by the Holy Spirit to bring new encouragement to me in June of 2016. Uh, he, he uses a phrase, he's troubled by what he calls, thank you, he's troubled by what he calls the American, made in America kind of Christianity. And I'm not saying that universally, like everything's wrong in this country, but we got to guard against a made in America kind of Christianity where we're just in it for the get out of hell free pass or whatever, and, and we just need, a, we, we need a, a, a baptism of the Holy Spirit that allows us to say, let's do this. So last Sunday, I shared a message kind of under the canopy, let's do this, uh, from 2 Kings chapter 13. Uh, and I realize on any given Sunday, there are folks that weren't here. And I, I, I'm not going to re-preach the sermon. You can relax. But I do want to set it up uh, a little bit by just reviewing the story from 2 Kings chapter 13. So if you've got your Bible, you may want to turn to that passage. Because I got some amazing questions asked me after that sermon that obviously... I didn't have time to include in the sermon. So this series that really didn't start as a series, it started as a let's do this, and then Pastor Brent said, why don't we make it a series? And then the series went into the bows and arrows last week, and, and uh, now I, wanna, I feel like the Holy Spirit is saying, I want to push this subject a little further with you. And so 2 Kings chapter 13, and picking up in verse 14, uh, we've got... Israel in a whale of hurt, and they're in a hurt because they turned away from the Lord, serving idols at the two temples that Jeroboam built up in Dan and in Bethel, and uh, basically they had no relationship with God, uh, and, and no love for God, no passion for God, and as a result, the Lord allowed the enemy nations to begin to prevail over Israel, not to be mean to them, but in an attempt to get their attention back to him. It's what Richard Owen Roberts calls uh, redemptive judgment. None of us like to talk about the judgment of God. We, we like to kind of think that it doesn't happen anymore. But gratefully, gra graciously, he'll allow stuff and sometimes bring stuff into our lives if we've been walking away from him with the main intention of getting us to come back. And so that's what happened. And so the Arameans from Syria were attacking Israel and prevailing. And so uh, the king, Jehoash, who has no relationship with God, no interest in the things of God. Isn't it marvelous how the Lord is no respecter of persons? Right? And the folks that we would probably write off and say there's no hope for them are the very people that God is dealing with. So Jehoash obviously has a stirring in his heart because he goes looking for the prophet. He goes looking for Elisha. And when Elisha, the prophet, was in his last illness, King Jehoash of Israel visited him. And in visiting, visiting him, actually wept over him. Because in seeing him, the, the king says, the king, I'm sorry, I jumped too fast. In seeing him, the king says, my father, my father, I see the chariots and the charioteers of Israel. Well, the king is looking down in the face of, of the prophet who's dying on his deathbed from the illness that eventually takes his life and he's not looking at chariots and charioteers no he says that because he realizes that the that the hope of Israel the nation over which he's a king is not in their literal arm arms and armor and warfare but rather in the power of the Holy Spirit through men of God and women of God but men in this case just like Elisha so he recognizes the hope of that Israel has in Elisha's relationship with God. America is nowhere near acknowledging this. But its only hope 
is in a revived church of Jesus Christ. Not President Obama, not President Trump, not the Democrats or the Republicans or whatever the latest initiatives are politically. The only hope this country has is a revived church. Believers starting to live and act like Jesus. That's the only hope we've got. And that's exactly what Jehoash saw looking down in the prophet, realizing this was Israel's only hope. And what what the text doesn't tell you, but what you need to know is all over Israel at that time, there were what was called schools of the prophets. And most Bible scholars that I've studied don't believe that those were people learning how to prophesy, although the prophetic anointing was active in those men and women. Those were actually communities of faith all dotted through Israel who refused to worship Baal, refused to bow their knee to the golden calf, and stayed true to God. That was Israel's hope. And tragically, those schools of the prophets are about to lose one of the chief teachers, instructors, and leaders of those schools of the prophets, Elisha. And so a combination, I think, of, of, of the fact that the king came to visit him and a combination of the Holy Spirit's stirring in the prophet Elisha. And by the Holy Spirit, he gets up and gets out of bed and he tells Jehoash, get a bow and some arrows. And the king did as he was told. Then he says to the king, put your hand on the bow, get an arrow, put your hand on the bow. And then it just, this is the part of the verse that just, I got to just stop uh, uh, myself from just going crazy with this verse. Then the prophet puts his hand around the king's hands, which simply tells me that our best of intentions and the best of things we pick up our hands to do are useless unless the Holy Spirit is invited in and wraps his arms around us and puts his hands over ha our hands, his feet over our feet, his lips and anointing through our mouths, then we can do mighty exploits for the king when the Holy Spirit is wrapped around us. Oh, come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Then Elisha says to Jehoash, open that eastern window, simply because that's the general direction uh, that the enemy, the enemy was camped at Aphek, which is actually on the east shore of the Jordan River. And we think that this event happens in Gilgal, which is on the western uh, uh, highlands of Ju Judah, Judea, looking down over the Jordan River. So the enemy's not anywhere near Elisha's house, but that eastern window simply is part of the identification that he and the king have that the enemy is out east, and so we're going to shoot an arrow. So he says to the king, shoot, so he shoots the arrow. Elisha proclaims this, I love this, Elisha proclaims, this is the, arrow, this is the Lord's arrow. <laughs> this is kind of where I'm going right now with this message. This is the Lord's arrow. When I finished preaching last week, some, some wonderful, gracious folks, very, very supportive, very kindly, said to me, there's a great message, and I really was stirred by how the Holy Spirit was stirring you. But, but what are those arrows? What are my arrows? And so I thought, okay, I know where I'm going with this. He said, this is the Lord's arrow. I want you to get this this morning. This is the Lord's arrow. I don't mean this literal arrow. Some of you don't know me, but, but I'm speaking figuratively. This is the Lord's arrow, and it's an arrow of victory. Get that down deep into your heart this morning. This is the Lord's arrow. The king picks it up. The Holy Spirit's hands in Elisha are wrapped around him, and he tells, the, he tells the king, this is the Lord's arrow, and it's the arrow of victory. Westgate Chapel, I'm going to take, by God's grace, the next few Sundays to point your attention to the Lord's arrows. And I want you to know that the difference between an occasional victory and getting a little relief here and there from the enemy and a colossal victory is whether you hear my voice and pick up the arrows of the Holy Spirit that is put in your hand and recognize they are the Lord's arrows and they represent the Lord's victory. I want you to get hold of that. 
For you will completely conquer the Arameans at Aphek. At this particular time in history, the Arameans are camped at Aphek waiting to attack. And now the king's actions under the instruction and hands of the Holy Spirit is what release what Dr. Ricky Moore talks about, the untamed and untamable wind of the Spirit. We, we are desperate for this, folks. What we don't need, even at Westgate Chapel, is just more services as usual, more ministry as usual, same old, same old. What we need here, I'm not talking about weirdness now. I'm not talking about people having license to get weird. I'm just saying we need desperately for the lives of the people around us, our families, our children, and our children's children. We need the release of the untamed and untamable wind of the Holy Spirit. So the arrow is shot, and the king is told that he, that he has been given victory, at least over the Arameans at Aphek. But, but the devar of the Lord, the word of the Lord from the prophet to the king was not complete. And so then he says to the king, Jehoash, he says, pick up the other arrows. Now, one arrow has just been shot out of the window, and the, and the king's gotten some temporary relief. He's excited to know that there is some victory that is in sight, and the, and the Elisha says, pick up the other arrows and strike them to the ground. Now, this is curious because at least in his mind, the king knows what a bow and arrows do, and, ha and shooting an arrow out of the window, even though it was a supernatural prophetic act, it made sense. You shoot arrows with a bow out of the window or some direction, that makes sense. But to take the arrows and beat the ground in the natural made no sense at all. But in reality, what the Holy Spirit was saying to the king, and he was too distracted, too careless, and too indifferent to get it, is that by the striking of the arrows on the ground, if he kept striking, God was going to give them a colossal and complete victory over the enemy until the enemy is laid out on the ground. And that's why he was to strike these arrows to the ground because through the unconventional yet supernatural means of the power of God, the enemy, God's desire, was that the Arameans would be laid out on the ground. But it's a test. It's a test at this moment of the king's conviction. At the prophetic word that was coming to the king, is it really going to make a difference? Is this action going to have any real or lasting consequence? That was Jehoash's test. And child of God at Westgate Chapel in 2019, that is our test. Is the striking of the arrows on the ground going to make any lasting difference? And just like Jehoash had to face that test, we had to fa have to face that test. Unfortunately for Jehoash and Israel, he picked the arrows up and struck the ground three times. Well, the man of God was angry with him. He said to him, the king, you should have struck the ground five or six times or multiple times. Then you would have struck Aram until you would have destroyed it. But now you're only going to strike Aram only three times. And in fact, when you read the subsequent chapters, you learn that that's exactly the number of victories that, that they had over Aram. And from that point on, after those three victories, Aram continued to be a thorn in Israel's side. Listen, Jehoash's response was half-hearted, so he missed the colossal victory. It's not enough for me to strike the arrows, and I'm not drawing undue attention to myself by saying that. It's not enough for all my pastoral colleagues to be striking the arrows. It's time, Westgate Chapel, for every one of us who follows Jesus to recognize the significance of the battle we're in and the necessity for every child of God with the Holy Spirit in residence to pick up these arrows. Now, just very quickly, I want to talk to you about the enemy. The Arameans represent demonic powers 
in our world today behind structures and strongholds that are currently controlling our culture. Okay? The battle in our day and age is not a physical warfare against flesh and blood. The battle is the realization that Satan, whom Jesus said has come to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus said, but I have come that you may have life and you may have it more abundantly. Colossal life. Not just impacting you and those in your immediate family, but colossal life that impacts your neighborhood and your community and God willing at some point our whole region. But, but the necessity is for us to understand we have a very real enemy who is accessing. And we know that from Ephesians chapter 4. We're talking about a whole list of sins. Paul says to the Ephesians, don't give the enemy a foothold. Don't let him get his toe into your tent. Don't let him get in and establish through unconfessed sin a stronghold from which the enemy can operate. Tragically, in our culture... We have whole systems in society that are under the dominion of the enemy because sin has invited him in to have a base of operations. The enemy represents the antichrist spirit that is rampant in our world right now, destroying the very foundations of what we believe is God's abundant life. And we live in a world and an age that is trying to muzzle the church of Jesus from talking about this abundant life. Christians all around us are compromising, many capitulating to the enemy, fearful that standing for the un unmitigated truth of the gospel and who Jesus is will get them labeled as haters or bigots. And the urgency today is that if we're going to see the next generation saved, it's only going to be a massive outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the body of Christ. Revival. And the greatest obstacle to revival right now is a casual and largely indifferent church. It's the greatest obstacle. It's why I feel this sermon series is such an urgency in my heart to share this with you because Jehoash is us. We've shot a few arrows through the eastern window. We've seen a few victories that have been marvelous. But unfortunately, we, we, we just feel we're good with that. We're good with just a few victories here and there. I don't think, I think we're coming to a place where we're not good with that anymore. A victory or two is not going to be enough to handle the onslaught of what's coming. And the word of the Lord to Westgate right now is pick up God's arrows and strike the ground and keep striking the ground with them. Listen to me. Jehoash... This is so important for us. Jehoash was not convinced of anything significant happening when he tapped the arrows to the ground or he would have still been there smashing the ground. He was not convinced that anything significant was, was going to happen. And that's where we are. I'm going to talk to you about arrows and over the next few weeks. And by the grace of God... Uh, and don't worry, don't count the arrows and think, we got 13 sermons coming on the... Uh, but, but the problem is I can talk to you about the arrows and even convince you from Scripture that these arrows have been placed in your hand and still, if you're not convinced anything significant is going to happen with them, you're just going to do like Jehoash did. And so we tap a few times, get discouraged, and walk away uh, because we serve a God we can't see. There have been times in my life when I've told the Lord in the privacy of my study. I mean, I didn't do, you know, I, Paul saw Jesus when he was in prison in Jerusalem. Jesus actually showed up in his, in his uh, prison cell to tell him to hang in there. And I know Paul had much more consequence than perhaps I do in my life, but I've told the Lord sometimes, if you were going to even send an angel, this would be a great time to <laughs> let me see an angel. Because we serve a God we can't see. You sense his presence, 
You, you discover his character and his nature in the word of God, but, but still you can't see him. Very few of us hear his voice in a direct enough way that we know exactly that was his voice. So we get discouraged because we can't see God and we're opposed by an invisible enemy. This enemy that's out for your children and your children's children and even this nation, he hides behind systems and structures and authorities and so you can't see him. It's not a visible enemy. So what do you mean hit the ground with some arrows I can't see at the word of a God I can't see to attack the enemy I can't see? Oh, I'm out of here. Let's go watch the Seahawks lose, right? <laughs> I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> Anytime there are people from Westgate Chapel that miss church because of the Seahawks, they're going to lose. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. That's not a word from the Lord, I'm just... So we've been given arrows that don't look like weapons, right? Nor do they appear to have any direct and measurable impact on the battle. That's a challenge for us. Yes, the whole victory belongs to the Lord, but he has chosen to bring us into partnership with him and our zeal in that partnership matters to him. I don't have the scripture reference at my fingertips right now, but if you don't think it matters, go search out Chronicles where King, I think it's Joash in, the, in Judah, Tears, when he reads the word of God and realizes how far they've fallen, he tears his clothes and he goes into a sackcloth and ashes and he weeps and the Lord says the, sends the prophet to him and says, because you wept and because you tore your clothes and because you humbled yourself, I'm going to give you the answer that you're looking for. He's looking for some zeal. He wants some passion. If we really believe that he exists, and he's the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And if we really believe that the enemy exists and that we've been given weapons that will tear his strongholds down, then the Lord is saying to us, come on, people, let's do this. Yeah. Let's do this. So the arrows, quickly. So let me just take you through, in case you think this guy's stuck in the Old Testament and I want some New Testament validation. The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. I'm using physical arrows here, but, but our real weapons, we're going to talk about the real arrows in, in your hands, are not of this flesh, but they have divine power to destroy strongholds. I want you to read that verse with me. All the way to the back of the balcony, all the way to the front, I want you to read. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh of this world, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. If God has said that, then the Holy Spirit baptized Westgate Chapel, moms and dads and grandparents and kids and young people, baptize us with a fresh baptism of faith to take you at your word, Lord, that you've said these arrows, these divine arrows are empowered by the Holy Spirit to tear down the enemy's strongholds. The problem is we tapped at the enemy two or three times and nothing happened, so we walk away. Can I tell you a quick story, a little digression? Hopefully I'll remember to get back on track here. But Mario Murillo wrote a book years ago called Critical Mass, tiny little paperback book, he's an evangelist. And he wrote a book on the, the nuclear phenomenon called Critical Mass. And he described something, those of you who are scientists will have to correct me afterwards, but he described something. He said when the original researchers, the scientists, were trying to split the atom and release the power in the atom, they had a neutron beam that they were focusing on the atom. And they noticed after months and months of research that as they focused that beam on the atom, it actually got smaller. And when they saw it get smaller, they thought, we're obviously on a rabbit trail here, turned the neutron beam off and went home. Over and over again, thinking, this thing's going the opposite direction, so, so we're going home. When in reality, what they learned later was they actually had to turn up the intensity of the neutron beam. When that, when that atom appeared to be shrinking, it was actually getting to that 
point of explosion and the release of the power. That has spiritual application for us. Because we've got the arrows of God in our hand and we tap the ground with them two or three times and because we don't see something happen right away in the way we wanted to, we come to the wrong conclusions. Turn off the neutron beam and go home. That's what Jehoash did and he lost the victory. So the arrows, the arrows, the arrow is a, is a missile, the, the dictionary tells me, with a straight, thin shaft and a sharp, barbed head. I've only got one here that has, I've got, I've ordered the other ones. I didn't realize how hard they were to find, but, but I've got one with a sharp head. So an arrow is a missile. I like that. And it has a sharp barbed head at one end and it has veins or feathers on the other end to stabilize it in flight and help with its accuracy. And the head is barbed in such a way that after it penetrates either what you're hunting or the enemy, it actually is barbed in a way that it does more damage when you try to retract it. I like that too. God wants to use the arrows he has given us by the Holy Spirit to inflict significant damage on the enemy and to bring colossal victory into the people of God. For we are not fighting flesh and blood enemies. It's not the neighbors. It's not the ladies on Edmund's moms who are going off on Jacinta and Krista. It, the enemy is not a political party or judicial activist. That's just a distraction. The art that we're fighting, not against flesh and blood, but evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world. Against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in heavenly places. And the instruction and the significance of Elisha's instruction to Jehoash to strike the ground is that while he was striking the ground in Gilgal, miles away from the enemy, if he kept striking the ground in full confidence and faith that this prophetic act was going to release the powers of God against the forces of darkness, he would have seen a complete annihilation of the Aramean. So, striking the ground in faith. The arrows themselves that God has given you are actually have prophetic significance. The Holy Spirit infuses the arrows he's put in our hand with significance. And here's what's important. Something done by faith in the power of the Holy Spirit in one context supernaturally impacts and changes outcomes in another context and another time. So we're able by the power of the Holy Spirit to strike the arrows right here as the believers that we have partnered with in India are facing unspeakable persecution and opposition by the enemy. And we should do it not saying, what are my prayers going to affect? We're two, we're thousands of miles from India. And what does Indian government care that we're striking the arrows? No, when we strike the arrows in faith, God releases his power and the warring angels of the Lord are dispatched and the victory of God is all but guaranteed when we strike the arrows two significant pieces to prophetic action I want to point out to you we need a clear understanding of what the arrows are in our hand and thank you Mark for asking that question last week because that's that really is helpful we need a clear understanding of what these arrows are in our hand and two we need a fresh baptism of God's faith that we would take these arrows and strike the ground convinced that they are designed to destroy strongholds of the enemy just very quickly I think some of these arrows that we've got in our hands are worship some of them are prayer the Word of God Forgiveness. Pastor Ron teaches a whole segment in uh, basic training that forgiveness holds up the victory in a, a way too many cases. Forgiveness, unity is huge in the body of Christ. But I want to land this message this morning by leaving this one thought with you. I just want to concentrate on one arrow. Time. Why? Because I think time is the umbrella in which all of the other arrows operate. 
Time is the context for exercising every other arrow. You see, the goal of the Christian life is God. He's the one that defeats the Arameans. He's the one that brings the victory. And the objective of the arrow is proximity to God, intimacy with God. No intimacy with God, partial victory. No intimacy with God, no complete defeating of the enemy. This Christian life is about a relationship with God. Listen, forgive me for getting a little academic here quickly with you, but if our whole concept of salvation is a one-time declaration of the judge, God, that you are justified, one and done, and you're finished, no other time required, no other effort required, if that's your understanding, then you live the rest of your life to, to suit yourself. And the only problem you have is that kind of Christianity is not in the Bible anywhere. Or you live, your concept of being saved is that Christ's justification is simply the doorway that the Holy Spirit opens for you into a life of fellowship with God. And that fellowship with God is where the power of God is released. Then you've got to face the hard question of what's the priority that Jesus gets of your time. You see, in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, all believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread, also communion, and to prayer. And that word devoted means they persisted obstinately in. <laughs> Breaking the arrow is not in the sermon script. <laughs> Continually insisting on, it's what devoted means. Standing perpetually in, it's what devoted means. Attaching oneself to, spending time with, is what is what that word means, devoted. And these early believers were devoted. That devotion put them in proximity of God. That devotion is where the power of God is released. And the best example, I'm almost done here, but the best example I can think of is Jesus continues with his disciples and they come to a certain village, Bethany, where a woman named Martha welcomes him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he taught, but Martha was distracted by a big dinner. And I know you ladies who are, who are wonderful hostesses, this, this story always troubles you because bottom line, somebody's got to get the meal ready. But I think what Jesus was actually saying was the meal can wait, I think. And so Martha is distracted, and she comes to Jesus, and she says, Lord, it seems unfair, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here? She's not productive. She's not doing anything. She's not accomplishing anything. What Martha doesn't know, Mary's doing something. Yeah, she's, she's using her time to strike the ground simply of being in the Lord's presence. Tell her to come and help me, get in the kitchen. But the Lord says to her, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset about all these details. Wow, listen to this. There's only one thing worth being concerned about. That's what I'm saying to you, Westgate, and as I say it to you, I'm saying it to me. There's only one thing being concerned about. Mary's discovered it. What has Mary discovered? It takes time at Jesus' feet if you're going to be drawn in to the miracle that he's preparing for you and your family and for your future. Without that arrow in your hand beating against competing verses and, at de that de and demands into their defeat in your life, you're going to be destined to half victory. And Jesus said, he's come to give you life, life more abundantly. Yeah, that's true. But you got to take that time arrow and you got to keep beating it until every competing voice and distraction is beaten into submission. Right now we live in a world where time is a tyrant. 
They've even got watches now, which I refuse to have. God bless you if you've got one that dings or beeps or vibrates your wrist when an email comes. I have enough problems getting to all my emails. I don't need to be beeped or vibrated when another one's coming in. It's absolutely demanding all of your time. We've got time on our clocks and time on our phones. We, we got schedules that keep us running to other people's, not even sometimes our own priorities. We've got entertainments and sports that get allocated, allocated huge quantities of time in our lives. And what suffers is fellowship with him, time with him. So you want to grab an arrow that affects all the other arrows, grab the time arrow with me this morning. And I want to encourage you to do just three very quick things, and I'm going to be done with that. I want you to take this arrow called time, and I want you to submit it to the Lord this morning. Now, listen, folks, that doesn't mean, look, I'm not saying that doesn't mean you've got to stop doing fun stuff, or you, you can't watch a Seahawks game, or what, I, I'm, just, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, because the Lord, the Lord is not a tyrant. And when he asks of our time, it's not because he's a time master or a superintendent looking down his nose, because it's because he knows the way to abundant life. So he's just saying, I want you to surrender your time to me and keep surrendering. And can I suggest to you the best way to do this? Three things, just very quickly. One, I, I want you today to, to put this before the Lord and say, Lord, in my day, during my day, where do you want the priority of time devoted to you? Where, where do you, what do you want? And don't be afraid. Because whatever he asks you, there's blessing. And this is not about guilting yourself or being, uh, yeah, you know what I'm saying, right? Th there's, there's life here. This is, not, this is not some dry check, a checklist kind of thing. The Lord's just saying, bring your time to him and ask him in a 12-hour in a daytime period uh, or 24 hours. Where's the time, Lord, that you would have for me to be like Mary and get so close to you that I would understand your ways and, and see the release of your power in my life? And then write that down somewhere and tell somebody else who can help you stay accountable. This is very quiet in here right now. <laughs> so it's your days. Take your day to the Lord because you're not going to see the Arameans completely defeated unless you start beating this arrow to the ground. And it's the arrow of your time surrendered to the Lord. And then look at your week. And then say, Lord, here's seven days, 24 hours, seven days. Here's my week, Lord. What time would you want devoted to you in that week? And let him speak to you about your week. Can I say something here at the risk of being misunderstood and making some of you angry? But, but I, I've got nothing against piano lessons for your kids and violin lessons and soccer lessons and tennis lessons and croquet lessons and badminton lessons. I've got no problem about that. But you need to first, before you sign them up for stuff, and it's fine, but you need to put your week out there and don't teach your kids that the first priority is that they play a violin real good or get to be soccer stars. You, you, you're going to get to the age like me where I'd much rather have my kids following and serving the Lord than being some soccer star someplace. And soccer is perfectly fine. Let them learn how to be a light in that soccer environment by helping them to steward their time and giving the Lord the priority of their time. So this week of, is not really your week, it's his. Lay the week before him and have him. I hear Pastor Aaron and Anna say there are folks that don't want to be in groups because they're too busy. Then you know what? You're too busy. Give, give the Lord some time. Can't come to prayer meeting on Tuesday night because I got just too much going on. Then you got too much going on. Give the Lord your week. Restructure your priorities. Some of you may need to start going to bed at a decent hour and turn the jolly television off in order to get up at the hour the Lord wants you up. My email address is arolands at... at shorelinecommunitychurch.com. 
right? And then lastly, so you've given them the, your day, your week, and then lastly, would you consider even in a year's calendar, would you consider planning two or three days away? And I know for young moms, hey, I realize, I, I, I read a book one time that said, the pastor told young moms to get some time with the Lord, and the young mom said, I can't even go to the bathroom by myself. I said, so I, we realize, right, there's stuff, but, but, but would you consider maybe a couple of days a year where you just go before the Lord like Mary, and you say, Lord, what do you have in store for my life? What do you want from me? See what I'm saying? Time, your time is your most valuable commodity, and it's an arrow that God has put in your hand, and if you'll take that arrow of time and strike in faith, strike the ground, you're going to be amazed at the victories God is going to lay out for you because that arrow is mighty to the tearing down of strongholds. And when you use it in the power of the Spirit, you'll be amazed to see how the Arameans in your life are going to be defeated because you've given the Lord your time.